Island and Māori tattoos are more popular than ever, and the designs have become famous and recognisable all over the world. The practice of tatau began over 3,000 years ago. The art form travelled across the Pacific and various islands developed their own specific styles and patterns. The first Malo Fia I ever saw was on High Chief Peter Maivia on, on the mat when he was wrestling. I was like seven or eight. I remember asking my, my ma, what's that? So I'd say Samoan tattoo, you know, Samoans get it. And I just remember thinking how cool that was. The Tongans used to tattoo back in the days, but they just don't do it anymore. It got outlawed. But in the last few decades, the lost art of tatau has made a resurgence. A lot of our designs were pulled back from our carvings to bring back into tatau. Our people were practical and they evolved and they changed with the times, but the essence of moko hasn't changed at all. This is the story of tatau, from the past to the present and into the future. Steve Marching started tattooing in the 1980s and has seen a lot of changes since then. None of the islanders wanted island tattoos. You know, you get the average island guy and they come in, I want a panther, eagle. No such thing as a cultural identity back then. They were one of the European things. So I started off with doing dragons and lions, what they call neo-tribal. You know, they're black waves. The taulima was a simplified version of the pea, and in the 90s it became popular in Aotearoa. Tattooing started to head off over here. That was the first thing people were thinking of, you know, they didn't want to get a full pea, so oh, hey, we'll get a um, kauvai or kaulima, you know, armbands and that. I think it was sort of like the it tattoo in the 90s, and it became like a real signifier of where you're from, particularly like in Auckland and New Zealand and multicultural communities, it was like a way of really showing like, yep, yeah, I'm someone, I got my kaulima. <laughs> people started wanting the armbands, and then I thought, hey, you know, like, why just armbands, you know, why don't we extend those armbands and make them into sleeves? And more of the rugby guys started getting into it, and so they sort of spread the word more than anything, I think. This is how we do it every day, we be grinding. The, the sleeves became very popular, but there was one in particular that would get a lot of attention. When I was about 14, my old man come back from Australia, and um, this one was, he come back and it was just a, got a tattoo, it was all pretty, it wasn't too straight, so. Yeah, even though it was all squiggled, the guy was probably doing a tattoo like that, you know? Yeah. I did some, um, went down to some cherry picking, and you know, I come back with a couple of hundred dollars. I asked the old man if I could get a tattoo on my forearm, same as him, but a little bit straighter. You know, I kind of greased up to him, you know, I said, oh, that tattoo look mad, you know, come on, Dad. And um, yeah, sweet ass took me down. At first I got the, just the band on my forearm. So I had that when I was 14, and then one of my mates, um, one of my boys, uh, Willie Bernard, he had the full sleeve. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, I wouldn't mind getting it just to the forearm. When I was about 20. Steve Marching in um, Newland, he's a really good tattoo artist and uh, just got it, went from there. Yeah man, he's, he's a man. Yeah, I think that's been the most copied piece of work I've ever done, you know. <laughs> like I've had people claiming they had done it and all sorts. Definitely part of my heritage I think that's why I got all the tattoos, just to probably get sick of Sick of quarter Māori, Samoan. <laughs> Nothing against Māoris, man. Come on now. From there, the popularity of tatau exploded. What is the significance of your tattoo, your tatau on your arm? Oh, how I wish I was a tattoo. Come here, come here, come here. Come here, come here. Come on over here and feel my tattoo. Come here, Oh, hold on, hold on. talking about tattoos, tattoos. This is the mono, which is Mako here, right? Mako, the shark. Yep. Mako. Uh, it's our Amakua, my family's uh, family crest. It's, uh, it's our guardian, so it's the shark. And it's supposed to take the darkness out of your heart and bring the light in, but we're still working on that. <laughs> when The Rock started doing the, the, the arm, you know, the shoulder, 
all of a sudden, everybody was on it. You definitely get people coming in like, oh, I want to have the Sonny Bill Williams sleeve, or oh, I want to have the rock tattoo. <laughs> and they're not necessarily Polynesian or Samoan. And you have the conversations, and it becomes really about educating, and it's like, well, no, you can't have that tattoo. <laughs> I always suggest to them, if you are not Maori or not Polynesian, you are better off doing a mixture of everything because you don't want to just put Maori stuff and get hassled by the Maori or put Samoan stuff and you get jumped down the street by the Samoans. I got this tattoo at a skinhead place in Christchurch and it was a wolf because I love wolves. But I didn't have much money so they had to shrink it so my wolf looked like a cat. And so for years people were like, oh that's a nice cat and I was like, that's a wolf. This was a Vailima label. I remember walking into the studio in Ponsonby with the Vailima carton. And I went, I want that picture. <laughs> but that was all practice. It's like I was collecting these tattoos because it's like I started getting tattoos just to see if I could handle the pain. Despite all that practice, nothing prepared me for the pain of, of this. It was like next level. <laughs> You know, you're lying there with your lava lava and the assistants are doing their best to kind of protect your dignity and your modesty. But you don't care. And it's just that thing, you're in the room and you're the most vulnerable you'll ever be, I think, physically anyway, because you're just a wreck. You know, you're getting six hours of just torture and just, you know, all your energy is focused on dealing with the pain, so you can't have thoughts like, oh, I wonder what blah, blah, blah thinks, or I wonder what the other blues are training, <laughs> you know? And all the pain, like, after every day, I was, like, hobbling like a hundred-year-old man. And at the end, it was just weird. It was like the pain was gone. I was just sitting there quite normally going, wow. And I said to Malika, I went, it doesn't hurt anymore. He goes, oh, it's because you're happy. <laughs> so we have the male tatau, the pea, and then the malu is the female counterpart. So it's a less dense design, um, sparse motifs on, worn on the thighs. And malu means to protect or shelter or shade. After I had my malu done, Sua was the one that gave it to me. He's a sulu ape. He actually said something to me that was really special. And um, he said, your legs will be strong and you will go as far as you can. It does symbolize myself as a someone born and uh, the way I was raised. So it is my strength. It is my culture. A lot of Pacific Islanders are now choosing to return to the islands to get their tatau. Nowadays, when our modern generation come to get their tautua, we tell them what it is, and they ought to know their tautua or their service to their family and to Samoa as a whole. They should know how to act, and carry themselves around in public and wherever. And when I look at it now, on one hand, I think, wow, those are beautiful patterns. And I think, cool, and I admire the Tafunga's work. And on the other hand, I just go back to that journey and it reminds me of why I did it, what you went through, and to kind of honour that. Not just think, oh, yeah, cool, got my cool tat. And then when you think this ritual has been played out over the last 3,000 years with the same tools and it's unchanged, and I think that's the real magic with this, it's the process. <laughs>
Some of those carvers became te tau artists and the revival of Tāmoko began. Yeah, we went through that band scene, we went through all of that sort of stuff and then the whole tramp stamp, you know, the lower backs, you know. But yeah, it's developed heaps on where it can go, you know, it's endless now. People are getting their throats done, they're getting the, the backs of their heads done, you know. Our biggest push is trying to push for facial moko and that's kind of, I'll make it, normalise it, you know. As a kaita, as a person who does moko kauai, I kind of felt like a hypocrite not wearing it myself, encouraging other women to do it and how can I be doing these markings on other women if I didn't feel like I should wear it myself? The Thao artists are pushing the boundaries as they create new designs using traditional patterns. But what makes the difference between traditional and contemporary Te Thao? Traditional is our Te Thao done with the ao, done with traditional tools and the traditional forms of Te Thao, so the Pea and the Mang. So then in terms of contemporary, that is work that moves away from those forms and from those placements. So it's using a lot of the same motifs, but what we see is that those designs are traveling to different parts of the body. There's places for the machine and there's places for, you know, the ao. And if, if you really want tradition, you know, go get the ao, ao work, you know, the hand tools. The introduction of new technology has not only transformed how te tao is done, but also how it looks. I think with the technology of the machines these days and, and the availability of tools, we are able to do styles that was never done by the ancestors. They had just the, the owls, the sticks and stuff, so they couldn't really draw anything beforehand. It was just all marked out. So. You know, us having a pen, we are able to draw it out first before we can even tattoo it. So you can have a, a better idea of what it's going to look like. I think another part of the process that's really important is working with the body and what suits her structure, her body structure. I think that's what ultimately makes Moko look good aesthetically, is getting the flow right. With me, I like, um, I like bold tattoos. I like simple. The designing depends on the shape of the body, whether they're tall and lanky or they, you know, short and stocky. So that's how I design the, the designs. And for me, I like the mahi to be more sleek on a female. Long lines and long puhuro and like really elongate the features. Te Tau is global now, and in great part that is due to like the spread of Samoans because we travel everywhere. But it's also that global media as well that spread it, and that's not necessarily on our terms. If we are Māori practitioners and we are applying moko, then it's going to be moko no matter what the culture of the recipient is. But I think if the artist is non-Māori and they're applying these designs on somebody, it just becomes a surface design if you don't know what you're putting into the skin. So I think it's important for the right person to do it. Attitudes towards te tau are changing, but there's still a lot of stigma that goes along with getting ink. I remember when I first got my thumb done, which was my first one on my hand, and my hand's fully done now, but I remember literally sitting there thinking, like, if I do this, there's no turning back. It's right in front of everyone's faces. While well, the designs and the tattooing style has evolved, so has people's reaction to it. You know, I have like an 80-year-old lady standing behind me at, at a checkout. One go, oh my God, that's disgusting. And then another one go, wow, that's like so intricate. Um, you can't please everybody, you know, so I mean, at the end of the day, it's up to you. Now you're seeing a lot more hands, feet, legs, um, full sleeves, facial tattoos, and just ones that aren't there to be hidden. I learned this beautiful saying for a lele lo pea, you know, fly your bat. <laughs> you know, show it off. Not to be a show off, you know, you don't want to discredit it by, for example, taking your shirt off at the club <laughs> <laughs> and doing stupid things like that. Many people that get the tao, especially traditional ones, will question whether they are worthy of wearing it. 
I think that's why a lot of women don't wear their mokokauai still, because they don't know if they're Māori enough. But I don't think that's, that's ever really an issue anymore. I think we're of this understanding that it is a visual representation of who we are, and it doesn't matter if we're half Māori or full Māori, that we're still Māori. I think it's a whole thought process that you go through being New Zealand born, my since second generation New Zealand born, Afakasi, and it's all these things like, am I good enough? Am I Samoan enough? Is it okay for me to wear those marks? And then being the person that's, you know, doing these tatar for people, it's totally a spectrum. And there's no box that you have to tick. You know, if, if that's your heritage, that's your heritage. And it might be, a celebration of where you're from, or it might be the very beginning point of your journey to reconnecting you to where you're from. I think the more the people uh, get to know their culture, the more they wanna either tattoo their country pattern on themselves. I mean, I have people that um, half Tongan, and half Italian, but they look pretty much Italian and they hate it. For some reason, they hate being called a walk. So they come to get tattoos just to justify that they're Tongan. Myself having the tāvaka and my brother having the pea, it just symbolizes a lot of things. Getting the tāvaka is, for me, it's like an armor. It represents my identity, it re represents who I am. You know, just being on stage, you know, we, we sing you know, our own songs, which says, keep your culture. There was no use of us singing, keep your culture, and we're not doing anything about it. So, you know, this is our way of showing that we really do mean what we write. For me, in our Tongan words, we call it kupesi. You know, it's patterns that mean something to me, you know, as a Tongan identity. Traveling overseas is something I can be proud of. You know, I can wear high shorts and show my, you know, uh, what I have on, on my legs and my, and my body. For me, it's something that it's, even words can explain, you know, um, something that I'm really, really proud of. Growing up, I didn't really like acknowledge or like love my Fijian side. Like for me, I can identify a Pacific Islander by their tattoo. So for me, I wanted something from my dad's village and my mom as well. For Fijian design, you have some common patterns and you have some really classic a square, triangle, uh, bold images that only identifies to Fiji. People, when they see me, they know that I'm a Fijian. Uh, I just wanted one small one like this. But then the artist, he went from here to here, all around that. And I'm glad that he had that drive because otherwise there would have been something else on my chest. Identity is huge for Cook Islanders because we are, are we, are we Samoan, are we New Zealand Māori? No one really knows. Plot twist, we're neither. <laughs> so it's the in-between place. Literally, through migration, it's the, uh, identity will be huge and I think that's why it's so important to start looking at new designs. I was thinking, man, I wonder where in 10 years where tattooing would be, you know? We are pushed, like for me, to, to this day, I feel like I'm trying to push a craft just to think that this is only today. Well, I imagine where we'll be in 10 years. I would have no idea. I guess it's up to us to shape that. As the Tao artists evolve, the line between what is traditional and what is contemporary can often become blurred. Tradition is such a problematic word, and I try to use it as little as possible because it's traditional to evolve. You know, that is a really important part of culture. If it doesn't evolve, then it dies off. And I think that speaks to our people being practical people because we can get stuck in the notion that only moko that is done by the uhi is real moko. But is it the tool that makes moko moko or is it the designs themselves and the, and the kōrero behind them? Our people were practical and they evolved and they changed with the times, but the essence of moko hasn't changed at all. And I think we need to remember that. There's only so many patterns you can use, you know, and then you've got to try to find new ways of inventing yourself so that everybody's not running around with stamps, you know, like a bit of uh, individuality. And some of the original ones I did were more stylized from the better shapes, you know, like the umango and the va'a. After doing so many, you, you, you sort of like got to 
venture out and try to break the mould a bit. This piece I've done on Shania has taken 30 hours, roughly. There's a circular piece in the middle. Looks mandala, but when you go up, it's actually got mouldy patterns through it. It's a lot of dot work. There's a lot of figuring it out as you go when you're trying new stuff. Is that going to flow? Is that going to work? If we black that out, is it going to be OK with the dots? And then there's lines as well. So to try and get them to all balanced together in a long piece with a circle in the middle, there's probably five, six hours on top of design work and thinking and standing back and looking at it. Because once you put it in, that's it. You can't rub it out. Tatao artists continue to evolve their designs based on the traditional patterns that have existed for thousands of years. As we move into a future of more mixed cultures and influences, we can still look back to where it all began. I think spiritually our tūpuna are always guiding us, whatever it is that we're doing. But I think in terms of tāmoko, when we put these markings on our body, that we're bringing them forth. It's like it does connect you to your ancestors who had one. You know, I think of past relatives that I'd never met that maybe wore one. And I think, wow, it kind of links you to, it's, it is the marks of our ancestors. And even though they've evolved over the centuries, that's, you know, that's the thing that ties me into it. A legacy that our ancestors left behind that we constantly buy into and keep alive with our beliefs and our thoughts about what this means to us. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.